where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three. Strange things have happened there. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Chris James. Weird things keep happening. The other day, they sent me an update on my computer. And the next thing I know, all of my books, all of my notes for different things, word processing, the page was black and the lettering was white. Now, I don't know why that happened, but it took me forever to figure out how to switch it back. Why that happened from an update, <laughs> I'll never know. I sometimes wonder about some of these IT folks and their updates. Coffee! Get some! Get some now! At 4501 McPherson. The Organic Man Coffee Trike only has the best coffee in the universe. Well, at least on this planet. If you can't get there, from there, go to OrganicManCoffeeTrike.shop. Life is hard. Coffee makes it better. I was listening to Vic Hermanson on Trailer Trash Terrors talking about his time working in the hospital. And it got me to thinking about my time working in the back of an ambulance. There are a lot of similarities, yet the two are worlds apart. The following stories are all true. Names have been changed to protect me from any lawsuits. Uh, there are rules pertaining to things seen while saving people's lives. What has been seen cannot be unseen. I still can picture some of those folks as if it were yesterday. In 1983, uh, there was a grocery store fire, and I was in the middle of it. I was a firefighter, and uh, that was my job. Uh, this was an old-style store that sold things besides food. They had hardware and hunting equipment. As we were putting the wet stuff on the red stuff, boxes of bullets were exploding around us. The lead round stayed on the shelf, and the shell casing would go flying. That's because the round weighs a lot more than the shell. The bad thing about this old grocery store was, when they put a new roof on, they put it three feet above the old roof. They just built a new roof. So there was this huge air gap in between the, the top roof and the bottom roof, and that's where the fire was. Eh, hardly any way of getting to it, because this was an old building. It was made out of shiplap and strong planks. It was a total loss. At some point in the fire, I threw my back out. I herniated three discs. It was the most painful thing I have ever felt. Me being me, I went home hoping to sleep it off. I was out of work for several months as my body simply refused to bop back into shape. All the doctors did was give me painkillers that had some very interesting side effects. Uh, it did nothing to fix the problem, it just made the pain less. I stopped taking them after the first month because, well, codeine makes it kind of hard to go to the bathroom. It dries you out, if you know what I mean. A friend of mine was studying to be a chiropractor. He came by and he said he only wanted to use me for his skills practice. He promised he wasn't going to touch me. He lied. He told me to lay in one position and then another. He had me lie on my back and then on my stomach. He said, bring your right knee up to your chest. And when I did, he pushed down on my knee. My back made a loud cracking sound and I thought I was dead. This guy was a rugby player. 
he was as wide in the shoulders as he was tall. He jumped back in case I might try to bite him or something. I was pissed, until it dawned on me the pain had mostly gone away. I was able to stand up, and it only hurt when I moved or I bent over. I thanked him for lying to me, and I made an appointment to see a licensed chiropractor the next week. After only a few weeks, I was back to normal, or my version of normal. For unknown reasons, since I'd screwed up my back, the state was going to send me to school to learn a new trade. And what were they going to teach me? <laughs> How to be an emergency medical technician. Uh, see, they thought that medics didn't have to lift anything heavy. Boy, were they wrong. I never was paid to work in an ambulance. I did all the training, but I used it on the rescue unit instead. I did have to work in the back of of uh, several ambulances in order to get my training hours in, and it turned out to be a lot of work, for which I didn't get paid. The classroom was run by a bunch of paramedics from all over our area. Uh, there was a couple, as in married. I remember their names, but I'm going to call them Dick and Jane. Uh, Dick had a sense of humor that was worse than mine. If you are thinking of becoming a medic, you need two things, a strong stomach and a good sense of humor. The rest is all just minor details. When it's time to do your ambulance and your hospital rotations, do the hospital first. Uh, get it out of the way. Uh, mostly it will suck, and the nurses usually treat student medics like we're some kind of a subspecies. Uh, then you get to actually do medic things in the back of an ambulance. Some nurses will treat student medics like we're there to steal candy from the kids. I don't know why, but it's like a tradition or something. I could never understand this activity, but I did try to make the most of it. I was standing around the desk waiting for some patient to come in so I could watch and learn about saving lives. The head nurse pointed to a, a doctor who was walking down the hall and uh, said that I should go with him and watch a very important procedure. He was a doctor, and I figured we're in the emergency department, uh, so some kind of emergency procedure was about to take place. That which has been seen cannot be unseen. I stepped into the room, and the first odd thing I noticed was it was very dark. All the lights were out. I thought maybe the patient is light sensitive or something. The doctor was standing next to a table with a sheet covering the patient. He had small light shining right on the spot where he was going to work. He pulled the sheet up, and there was a posterior, a set of human buttocks, as Forrest Gump would say. No, 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 no. Uh, there's no emergency that could possibly involve that part of the anatomy. I was about to make my exit when the doctor saw me and he beckoned me to his side. This is very interesting, he said in a bit of a foreign accent. You must observe and take notes. I, it was too dark to take notes and I sure didn't want to in the first place. Uh, the doctor uncovered a tool tray and lifted out a device. It looked to be about 20 inches long and maybe an inch and a half around. He looped it up without so much as a, here it comes. He slipped it into the woman's rectum. She was not ready, nor was she happy by this uh, sudden intrusive procedure. The doctor didn't want me to leave. He kind of had one arm <laughs> on my arm. He had one hand on my arm, kind of holding me in place. Well, he told me what we were looking at. 
he, he he was explaining to me what I was seeing. Now, I must say it was impressive. It was something I had never seen before in my life, and I wished I hadn't seen at that time. The only way I can describe it is stand in front of the mirror and open your mouth wide. Look all the way to the back, past the teeth. Uh, that's kind of what it looked like inside there. Oh, there was no uvula hanging down, but there was a thingy, a polyp, hanging down. Uh, the doctor was a proctologist, and he was very informative. He told me all about what we were looking at and what he was going to do. He even took pictures of the insides. I was there for maybe 45 minutes. It might have been an hour. As I walked back to the nurse's desk, the head nurse just gave me a kind of a smirk. At a call, Dick found a rather large woman who had settled into a bathtub full of water, only to find that she couldn't get back out. Her body had formed a bit of a suction. The woman had used her voice to inform her neighbors that she was trapped. The maintenance man unlocked the door and he let Dick and his partner in. Uh, help was needed lifting this stuck woman from her tub, so more medics and a few firefighters were called to the scene. Dick got a bottle of cooking oil, and he lubricated the sides of the tub. So far, so good. Then he said, Everybody grab a flap. Well, what would you call it? There were arms and legs and a few folds of skin, and uh, people were grasping all the different parts, trying to lift this woman, and she came out of there like a cork from a bottle. All of that excitement of being stuck for well over an hour, and then having strangers, mostly men, uh, looking at her unclothed body, well, Dick had placed a small towel over her stomach to protect her dignity. She said she was feeling bad and she wanted to go to the hospital. She lived on the third floor of a building with no elevator. Now comes the fun part. The stairs are not wide enough to allow the right number of hands to carry this large woman down to the ambulance. It was a strain all around. At each corner, the stretcher had to be stood on end to maneuver to the next flight down. Old Dick was holding the head, and being a joker, he pushed the stretcher towards the edge, leaning the woman's head out over the rail, and he went, Whoa, don't fall. The woman screamed and passed out. The lawsuit wasn't all that long. A dick was suspended, and we got a new paramedic instructor. <laughs> I did learn that. Uh, just because you think something is funny, you should keep it to yourself until the patient is in someone else's hands. We got called to a house where an old man was having stomach pains. A boy was he. We arrived, and there were eight people sitting on a couch designed for four. The police were questioning them about being in the country, probably illegally. Remember, this was back in the 80s. No one spoke English, but one of the cops knew enough Spanish to let us know what was going on, mostly. The old guy had been to the hospital a few weeks ago, and now he was the proud owner of a colostomy bag. If you can't poop, they put an exit into your intestine, and you wear a bag that fills up over the day. This old guy was laying in a bed. The sheets were white around the edges, but they were brown where he was laying. Nobody had changed them in weeks. His last bath had been sometime around his trip to the hospital. There was a certain funk in the air. His stomach was distended, swollen, as if he were about to give birth. The bag was empty. 
Uh, we didn't want to move the guy, but there was no way to get him from there to the hospital without moving him. We used the edges of the sheet and carefully lifted the patient from the bed to the stretcher. That slight movement as we lifted must have freed up whatever was causing the blockage because, well, he started to go a lot. We got him into the back of the ambulance and we headed for the nearest hospital. The bag was full. It was beyond full. Uh, there was nothing we could do but vitals and wait. We didn't have to wait long. The cap on the bag popped open and poo went everywhere. And it was nasty. It was a combination of number two and number three. The smell alone was beyond anything a human should have been able to create. Uh, somehow I got poo on my white lab coat. This got me to wondering, why did we have to wear white when dealing with every bodily fluid known to mankind, as well as a few unknown? As students, our uniform was dark dress pants, a white lab coat. We had to have our own stethoscope, a BP cuff, a pen light, a notebook, pens, scissors, and a set of hemostats. Never used the hemostats, but we had to have them. Everything was stuffed into any pockets of the coat, making it look lumpy and uh, out of shape. Well, we did beat feet for Ben Tobb, and we delivered our patient, who was no longer complaining of stomach pain. He seemed to think that we had cured his problem. Our shifts were whatever we could get. You showed up and you hoped to see some action in the eight or ten hours that you were there. One day I wound up working 18 hours. And not because I wanted to, but because we never got by the ambulance station so I could get out. The lights stayed on, flashing red and blue the entire 18 hours. It was a busy weekend. We had patients lined up to transport as we were picking up other patients. Hospitals were beginning to call for diversion. Ambulances had to find other emergency departments to take their patients to unless it was a dire life-and-death threat. I had wanted some action, and I got my request. My very first patient was a heart attack still breathing, uh, just having chest pain and shortness of breath. Hey, I knew what to do. Put her on oxygen and monitor vitals. To make sure the oxygen cylinder wasn't confused with any other kind of gas, they threaded it in the opposite direction to what you might expect. You open the valve by turning it in the wrong way. Guess what happens if you turn it the way you think you should? <laughs> I had the oxygen regulator in pieces all over the floor of the moving ambulance. Pieces went everywhere. I had to scramble around trying to put the thing back together so I could treat the patient. <laughs> she sat there watching me, probably thinking that this ambulance would hire anyone with a pulse. The night was long and filled with bizarre things. I had never thought of. Med class only teaches you so much. They kind of skip over the nasty bits. We received a call for a vehicle crash. It was only a few blocks away, so we flew over arriving as the flames were still there. A Camaro, going at 80 miles an hour, had hit a Pinto stopped at a red light. The Pinto exploded, killing two young ladies. I made the mistake of sticking my head in to see if there was any chance of rescue. My first thought was, nope, not a chance. Head to toe, fourth and fifth degree burns. Uh, so much damage in such a short period of time. The driver of the Camaro was not breathing, but he still had a pulse. It's called traumatic asphyxia. 
We knew he was doing 80 miles an hour at the time of the collision because he was fleeing a smaller accident with the police hot on his trail. We bagged the guy using a handheld breathing device. You have to hold it in place with two hands while squeezing it with the third hand. See the problem there? We moved him to the back of the unit. The guy I was with had just gotten his special skills certificate, and he wanted to intubate the patient. Uh, you place a tube into the trachea by way of the mouth. I was holding the head steady so the other medic could place the tube when I felt the entire ambulance rocking back and forth very violently. I looked over my shoulder, and there was an extremely mad man uh, coming through the back door of the ambulance with about five police officers trying to stop him. It turned out to be the fiancé of the woman driving the Pinto. He wanted to have words with our patient. Well, actually, I think he wanted to kill him. I did a quick head count came up with the idea that me and my partner should run. I pointed out the situation to the other medic, and we both jumped out the side door. If five cops couldn't stop this guy, what could two EMTs do? Just to add some confusion to the situation, the driver's girlfriend had gotten burned along one arm and her shoulder, as she was screaming and crying the whole time. Once the fiancé had been removed from our ambulance and the girlfriend installed in the jump seat, uh, we headed for the hospital. We were able to go to the front of the line. There were three other ambulances there, but we had an emergency situation. As we were unloading, we got a call for another accident, but nobody was in the process of dying, so we didn't have to fly. We did have to stop at a gas station with the lights and the siren going to fill the tank enough so that we wouldn't wind up running out of gas. That was a scene. We were glad this was a relatively uninteresting call. Load and go and hopefully call it a night. We pulled into the hospital and discovered there were no patients waiting for our unit. The radio was silent. The lead medic pulled out all kinds of bits and pieces of paper from his pockets, and he got busy trying to write up the last 20 patients that we'd had, while me and the other guy went out to the ambulance to get it back into shape. There are some hospitals, like Ben Taub and Herman, that have all the latest and greatest medical equipment known to mankind. They hire only the best staff. Then, there are others that kind of have stuff left over from the 50s, and the staff are not that sharp. Uh, we were not at Ben Tob, nor were we at Herman. We were at one of those other places. A security guard ran in the door, and he yelled there was some guy doing CPR in the parking lot. All the nurses just looked at us. They were not allowed to perform any duties outside the building, so this was our call. Not thinking much about it, we grabbed a hospital gurney and ran out the door. Sure enough, there's some guy pushing on some woman's chest laid across the front seat of a vehicle. He was wasting his time because A, you can't do compressions on the seat of a vehicle, and B, he was doing them way too slong, <laughs> slow and not nearly deep enough. As I'm reading this, I'm reminded of Vic telling about doing CPR on door patient while using window patient's bed. If you don't understand that, go listen to Trailer Trash Terror's Hospital Stories. It was either part one or two. We grabbed the man and got him out of the way, and then we got the female out of the vehicle and onto the gurney. Right away, we knew she wasn't in cardiac arrest. She was flailing around and making noises. It looked like convulsions to me, but I was just a dumb trainee medic. It looked like convulsions to the other medic as well. 
The gurney didn't have any straps because it was a hospital gurney, not an ambulance gurney. My partner got his feet up on the lower braces, and he held the woman down while I wheeled all of us into the emergency department. The nurse said, take her to room something or other, and I maneuvered the gurney over to the appropriate room. We put an oxygen mask on her, and we were waiting for the nurses to come take over so we could leave. However, you know, the best laid plans and all. The nurse stuck her head in the door and said the doctor wants a heart monitor on the patient. But she's not having a heart attack. She's having convulsions. Uh, we must have looked like two stupid medics to her. Uh, she said the initial report was a heart attack, so put a heart monitor on him and stop arguing. Then she left. We didn't go over heart monitors in class because they weren't in ambulances at the time. However, the other medic sort of knew how to get one hooked up. He said I would have to remove the woman's clothing so we could get the leads in place. They didn't have the little white sticky things that they use today. They had these suction cups that you would squeeze the bulb, you'd stick this metal attachment to the patient's skin and you'd let go of the bulb and it would hang on like an octopus. And when you took these suction cups off of the patient, they would have a whole bunch of little round circles all over their chest from the contacts. Old school stuff here. <laughs> well, I was looking at the female patient, thinking kind of like Dolly Parton, only scantily clad and much cheaper looking. Okay, that doesn't sound quite right. The young lady wasn't really a lady, and she wasn't all that well covered. She was kind of well proportioned, shall we say. She had on a yellow and green zigzagging striped top and some nearly non-existent short pants. She had brown hair that stuck out in every direction. Her makeup was smeared all over the place from all the commotion over the last ten minutes. I had my handy-dandy parachutes out ready to remove said top. A couple of quick snips and she would have been ready for the leads. But I got to thinking. She's not really dying. There's no real big rush to get the heart monitor on her. I'll just pull her top off, and that way she'll still have some clothes when it's time to leave. I had to get my arms under her chest and up under her back. The top was very stretchy, but her bra had six, six, mind you, of those weird little hooks that most men find impossible to manage when there's only two. I had to work by feel. And with her weight interfering to an extreme, I had to get that sucker unhooked. After what felt like an hour, but was probably only a couple seconds, I had the last hook unhooked. I began to push the bra and the top all at the same time so that my partner could show me how brilliant he was being able to place a 12-lead monitor on the patient. The thing about a 12-lead monitor is it only has 10 contacts. It's one of those things. But it's still a 12-lead. As the clothing was clearing the top of the patient's head, she came to. In the blink of an eye, or rather the opening of two eyes, she was wide awake and there was some strange man taking her clothes off. She came unglued. She screamed, and she fought, and she tried to bite my face, which was the only part of me that she could get to. I had the top held firmly in both hands, holding her arms up over her head, but that was all the planning I could do. I had to avoid her teeth while maintaining my hold on her arms. My partner was kind enough to come over and hold her legs down so that she couldn't kick me to death. I remember Vic telling about the human roach. 
The nurse came running in, wanting to know what we were doing to her patient. Her patient? All of a sudden, this is her patient? It took several minutes to get the patient calmed down enough that I could extract myself from her, the room, and the hospital. By the time we got back to the station, it was about four o'clock in the morning. I'd been there since eight. In class, we would sit around comparing our days and nights on the ambulance. I tried to make myself sound a lot better than I was, but the story did win first place. Another of the students did come close. His ambulance, I know it wasn't his, uh, the ambulance that he was riding in, was called to the same hospital where I'd had my adventures at. Uh, there was a patient being transferred to Ben Tob. The reason was bizarre and spectacular. This patient had become curious about what the inside of his testicles looked like. Using a razor, he made an opening and had a look. He tried to use band-aids to close the incision, but what with all that bleeding, he was unsuccessful. He drove over to the hospital just to see if they could maybe put some tape on it or something. The staff shipped him over to a bigger hospital because this was well beyond their abilities to deal with. He was neither drunk nor on drugs, just curious. You know, curiosity killed the cat, but it did a lot worse things to this guy. In the treatment of patients, we were taught to not judge no matter what and to always keep our mouths shut even if the patient was unconscious. Things will get into their brains even when they're unconscious. We got called back to that same hospital where the fun with clothing had taken place. A patient had come in earlier with multiple gunshot wounds, and he was also being transferred to Ben Tob. The patient had been stabilized and some treatments given, but he was in need of advanced surgery. I got a look at his x-rays, and boy howdy, he was in a bad way. Both knees were messed up. He'd taken both barrels from a shotgun to both kneecaps at close range. The kneecaps were no longer attached to anything. His assailant was actually defending himself. This guy had attacked someone with a butcher knife. Uh, the person with the shotgun, once this guy was on the floor, then proceeded to beat him over the head with the barrels of the shotgun. The patient had a red afro. Uh, some of you will remember those bizarre hairdos. Everything stuck out in every direction. The staff had shaved the front half of his head to get to the head wounds. Uh, the patient also had a broken nose and two black eyes. So now his hair was sticking out like this. And it was all dyed bright red from the blood. Well, actually it was brown. Uh, he had a huge red swollen up nose and he had two black eyes and I looked at him and I started laughing which is not a good thing in the back of an ambulance but I couldn't help myself my partner asked what was so funny and so I told him the patient looked like Bozo the clown the hair was sticking out on either side and all matted with blood and his nose swollen and bright red. And then he had those two black eyes that kind of looked like clown makeup. Oh, now my partner's laughing as well. The medic driving was still in the dark, so he yelled at us to knock it off back there. And only when we arrived at the hospital did he get to see and this got him to laughing as well. The nurses at Ben Tob must have thought that we were a bunch of uncaring degenerates. Or maybe they laughed as well. Sometimes you just can't help it. <laughs> he would probably never walk right again, but he was lucky to still be alive. 
I worked the rescue truck until I joined the Border Patrol and I was shipped to Laredo. Once here, I kind of lost interest in being a medic for about a year. Uh, I had joined the res special response team and the guys in charge said they needed someone as a medic. He was looking right at me when he said this. They sent four of us to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio to learn medical stuff again, or to relearn it. Once more, I found myself holding a stethoscope and looking at people with owies and weird illnesses. What's that song by Pink Floyd? Pick up thy stethoscope and heal. It didn't take long for the other three guys to transfer out to other stations, leaving me as the only medic on the team. I had to take some more EMT classes so I would know as much as I could about people dying and how to try to stop it from happening. I was sent to Laredo Junior College and then Laredo Community College, which is the same place they just keep changing the name. I even took classes on my own, just in case I ever needed to know something. The SRT decided to put together a medical response unit. Uh, more training, but we did get a vehicle that we could use as a sort of ambulance. All kinds of cool toys to use in the care and feeding of the dead and dying. That's just a phrase I made up about 20 years ago. It's not really what we did, but that's what I told people we did. I wound up spending a lot of time at Mercy Hospital. Some doctors are absolute jerks, but some are cool. I was in the operating room watching a surgeon put in a stint in a person's intestines. Uh, there were several student nurses in the room. Most of them were standing against the far wall, looking up at the ceiling. <laughs> I guess the inside of a person just didn't appeal to them. The doctor noticed that I was leaning in, trying to get a better look, so he proceeded to give me a tour of the abdomen. He would lift bits and pieces up out of the way so I could see under them, and he would point out what all the little nasty bits were and what they did. We were waiting for the lab results to come back. Once we finished and the patient was being closed up, the doctor told me all about what he needed to do next and how the patient should respond. Way more information than I needed, but it was interesting. A young girl was brought in complaining of abdominal pain. The doctor placed his hands over the lower right quadrant and gave it a little push, and she really let him know to stop. Appendicitis. He took note of my watching his every move, and the next thing I knew, I was following Dr. Sands around as he examined patients. He would have me poke and prod and listen and look at things uh, I had no knowledge of. So he would wait until we were outside of the exam room and then he'd fill me in on what we'd seen and done. He was acting like I was a doctor or something. I told him I am just a paramedic student. He said that he knew that and he noticed that I was interested in all things medical and so he was going to tell me all about medical things. We wound up in the doctor's lounge for lunch. Uh, they have far better food in there than they do in the cafeteria. Other doctors were looking at me, uh, then at Dr. Sands, as if to say, what's that interloper doing in our realm? Dr. Sands finally tried talking me into going to medical school as in doctor training. Unfortunately, I had dropped out of school at 16. To go to med school, I would have to take four years of basic college, followed by a bunch of pre-med, and then find a medical school that would be willing to take me. It was all way too much brain work. Uh, Dr. Sands was opening his own medical school in Mexico. It was right across from Falcon State Park in Ciudad Guerrero. 
A super-rich guy in Monterey had been in the process of building a fancy resort when he wound up in prison. The doctor was able to lease the place for next to nothing. He was going to finagle me into the place without any of that college time. Well, the Zetas took over the town shortly thereafter, and the school was Kaputsky. I guess I was not destined to become a doctor. The unit I was assigned was a Tahoe. The back still had a seat, and there was no place to put the equipment. I pulled the seat out, and I put in a deck and some cabinets, and I had a sort of ambulance. The local medics didn't go out of town, and they sure the heck didn't go out onto ranches. I would get a call. There was an alien in distress on such and such a ranch. That was it. Go find him. It was a good thing I had worked sign cutting so many years that I knew all of the ranches down south. I would get in the area, and usually somebody could be close enough to point me in the right direction. Late one night, I got a call. A young female had been bitten by a rattlesnake. I drove out to the general location, and I found a couple of agents. They were standing about 50 feet from their unit, looking worried. I asked, where's the patient, and one of them just pointed to the back of their vehicle. I walked up, and there was a maybe 18 to 20-year-old woman. She was sitting sideways in the back of the unit. I asked her about being bit, and without even telling me her name, she pulled her pants down and showed me where she'd been bit. Remember, you got to have a good sense of humor. In certain situations, we were allowed to go above the normal medical treatments. If we were hours from the hospital or the situation was dire, we could do things that the rest of the EMS were not allowed to do. I carried a surgical kit just in case. I had sutures and I had some drugs that would uh, knock a patient out if I needed to. Just in case. Our medical control, Dr. Lopez, wanted us to be able to perform in drastic situations without having to try contacting the hospital, because sometimes we couldn't contact our own radio operators. Well, I looked at this woman's backside, and I got out my multi-tool, and I grabbed a huge cactus thorn, and I pulled. It wasn't a snake bite after all. As she had squatted down to relieve herself in the dark, and uh, she came down on a cactus. I cleaned the spot, and I told her to see her doctor tomorrow once she was back in Nuevo Laredo. Then I asked the two agents why they were acting so strange when I pulled up, and one of them said they were driving along this road, and they saw this woman running along the edge with her pants around her knees. They thought she was either crazy or dangerous or both. Had a family cross the river and wander out into the middle of this swampy area. This was the two weeks of the year that it rains, and when it rains in Laredo, it rains a lot. I spotted them from the edge, and I walked out to see what was going on. I could hear the old man breathing before I got close to him. He was making gurgling noises with each breath. He was swaying back and forth on his feet, and his ankles were swollen up. His lips were blue. His sister was walking with crutches through the mud. With each step, the crutches would sink into the ground. His daughter, who was about 25 or 30 years old, was mentally about 8 or 10 years old. I called for an ambulance to meet us at the closest road. Uh, there was no way of getting a unit even close to this old guy, so I called for manpower instead. We put him on a backboard, and we had to carry him out to where my unit was parked. Once there, I had an agent drive us to the ambulance where it was waiting. En route, I started oxygen, and I got an IV going. His pulse was rapid and weak. 
I told the medics he was having a heart attack, and uh, then I handed the patient off. The two women were taken to the station, and I drove to the hospital to see how my patient was doing. He was in sad shape. Congestive heart failure. After a few hours, an agent brought the daughter to the hospital so she could be with her dad. As she had been soaking wet after falling in a mud puddle, and so the agents had found her some dry clothes to put on, which just happened to be an old Border Patrol uniform. <laughs> this woman, or girl, was wandering around the ER looking at all the interesting things, and the nurses were all staring at her and then at me, and finally one of them asked, Is she one of yours? I said, no, she's she's from Mexico, but uh, I had to explain to them about the, uh, the mud puddle and the, the lack of dry clothing. Her father wound up in the ICU for several weeks. I got a nasty phone call from Washington wanting to know why I put an alien in the ICU. I asked, well, should I have just left him out there in the mud to die? Uh, they get all snitty with me about budgetary costs, and did I know how much an ICU was costing, and boy, did I. Finally, after about two and a half weeks, we managed to get him transferred to Nuevo Laredo Hospital, and, well, I never did find out what became of him or his sister or his daughter. I imagine he probably didn't make it out of the hospital because, well, the hospital in Nuevo Laredo is... At the time, it wasn't that good. Being a wilderness medic can be fun, and it can be a royal pain in the neck. We had a group of aliens being chased by a group of agents. One guy running through the dark stepped off into an arroyo, falling about six or seven feet. He probably wouldn't have been in too bad a shape, except uh, one of the agents chasing him wound up falling on top of him, causing some rather b bad trauma. I drove in as far as I could get, and then I pulled equipment out and I got a team together. We followed a trail through some thick brush until we found the injured alien and the not-too-injured agent. She had a nice, soft body to land on. We got the patient strapped to the backboard, and then we had to walk him back to where my unit was parked. I'm not going to guess how far we had to walk, but it was well over an hour just in one direction. Uh, during a rest break, I told the female agent that the patient had told me that he would feel much better if she would give him a kiss. She said, well, I'm not going to repeat what she said, but it pretty much meant she thought that was a bad idea. No, the patient did not say anything to me. He was unconscious. We finally got to my unit, and we loaded the guy in the back, and once more I had to get somebody to drive out to the ambulance where it was waiting. Uh, he had several broken ribs, a slight concussion, a twisted ankle, and a broken heart since the uh, girl wouldn't kiss him. Okay, I made that last part up. He spent two days in the hospital before being sent back to Mexico. I can handle a lot of nastiness. Uh, it doesn't bother me. Remember, strong stomach. Like I said, a uh, good sense of humor as well. When patients puke on me, I wish I was doing something else. We had a group of aliens run through a really deep, wide arroyo. It was so deep that you could actually drive through it, except for all the mud. One alien decided he wanted to fight. He spun around and he took a jab at the agent that was chasing him. I guess he'd watched a lot of movies and he thought he knew how to fight. It would be kind of like uh, messing with Chuck Norris after watching a bunch of kung fu movies. Well, he took a swing at an agent, and the agent popped him right in the chin, and he went down like a sack of wet mud. Well, the agent was freaked out. He was thought, oh my God, I've killed this guy. He, he was just defending himself. But uh, he was horrified, thinking that this alien had 
died on him right at his feet. It's uh, kind of unpleasant to have aliens die on you. I've had a few, and you think about it a lot. Good sense of humor, too. Well, they called me to the scene, and I got there, and I uh, checked the guy over. I did the old vitals and the heart monitor and a few other things, and I found he had some drugs in his pocket. The little uh, blister packs that you find all over the place, uh, these things had no markings on them. Uh, it was one of those kind of drugs. It's a stimulant that folks from Mexico like to take as they're moving through the brush. Uh, a kind of a speed kind of thing. Uh, well, like I said, no, no name on this drug. I had encountered it on several occasions. It had some really weird side effects. One being sudden bursts of violent activity as well as a complete lack of self-control. Uh, still have no idea what those drugs were. They were small white pills with no markings on them. Well, I enlisted the agent to drive us out, and I did the medical thing in the back of the unit. I was preparing the patient for an IV when he began to throw up. All over the inside of the oxygen mask, then all over me, and then all over the inside of my unit. I had to wipe everything down so I could get the IV going. Had the patient sitting sideways in the back of my unit, still strapped to a backboard so he could throw up on the floor and not choke to death on his own stuff. The oxygen mask was a t total mess, but I wiped it out with my sleeve and put it back on. My uniform was nasty. Uh, we had over an hour drive ahead of us, and, well, the smell was pretty bad, and the vomit became cold, and then it dried on my uniform. The only high point of that trip was we got to listen to Coast to Coast as we were going. I was working way up Mines Road when I got a call for a medic way down on 83 South. Uh, too far to drive in a short period of time, and it just happened I was the only medic working that night. Fortunately, the Army was working with us, and they had a chopper. I heard Arnold Schwarzenegger yell, Get to the chopper! Well, something like that. I drove to a spot where the helicopter could land, then I grabbed what I thought I might need. The call had come in that a group from Mexico had crossed near the old Walmart store down on 83 South. They were walking in the brush when one of them passed out and fell to the ground. Then he began convulsing. Their guide was somewhat freaked out by this man's activity. And so instead of running back to Mexico, he ran to the Walmart to use the phone and call us. He was there waiting when the agents arrived. He was willing to show them where the body was. The chopper had picked me up and flew to the location. I was dropped into the brush in the dark with no idea where the patient might be. I was going to have to walk in a big circle until I found him. The, the alien hadn't, I mean, the, the, the guide hadn't gotten there yet. He was still en route. I, it was hot. It was like 110 degrees. I was soaking with sweat before they arrived. Once they got there, the guide pointed out where he'd last seen the patient. There were tracks, but no body. We followed the trail, only to discover this had been a scam. Uh, the alien had faked an illness, so the guide would leave them, and they wouldn't have to pay him the rest of the fee. He had gotten something like $50 to get them that far, and he was supposed to get a couple hundred dollars more once they were at their destination. We questioned the guide, and he seemed to be a decent guy. He could have just hoofed it back to Mexico, but he chose to call us instead. Plus, he hung around, willing to show us where the patient was. We told him that he did not have what it was required to be a smuggler because most of the smugglers are nasty folks. 
Uh, we gave him a ride back to the border, and no charges were filed against him. See what happens when you're a good person. A lot of our time as medics was spent just trying to find the patient. One day we had a guy collapse while walking north along a fence line. The smuggler looked at him and said that was the end of the trail. He left the brother a burner phone and walked away. The brother called us, but he had no idea where he and his brother were. That whole thing about finding someone by uh, their cell phone signal is great in town. Uh, it doesn't work so well in the brush when you only have one tower to triangulate off. Well, you can't triangulate off of one tower. A pilot began flying around the area until the brother spotted the plane. By circling in close, the pilot was able to get us close to the patient. I was driving west while another medic, Robert, was driving north on another road, and we both ran into deer fences. We had to get out of our medic units and walk. Uh, once again, it was hot. It was over 110 degrees. I had to carry all the medical gear that I hoped was enough to add to the fun. We both wound up staggering to the patient at about the same time. The guy was making loud snoring sounds when he exhaled. Plus, he was twitching and jerking. A quick temperature check showed that he was 108 degrees. That's bad. That's real bad. Robert got an IV going while we waited for a unit to come pick us up. Uh, his blood pressure was super high. His, his pulse was well over 120 beats a, a minute. He was having heat stroke. A border patrol unit pulled up with several young, healthy agents who got out, and then they all stared at the patient, who was twitching and jerking and making weird noises. Like Almost sounded like he was growling, not so much gurgling. <laughs> well, uh, we told these young healthy agents, that we needed to get this alien in the back of their unit and take him out to the ambulance. I looked around and all of these Border Patrol agents had somehow managed to disappear into the brush. I guess they were afraid that the patient might be contagious or something. They'd watched too many episodes of uh, House or something. Well, there's nobody to put the alien in the back of the vehicle except me and Robert, the two old guys on the team. So we picked him up, lifted him into the back of this Tahoe. It was not a med ride. It was just a unit. And as we're putting him in the back of the unit, I heard something make a loud popping noise in my lower back. Uh, Robert looked at me and he asked, what was that noise? And so I told him about my back and how I had herniated discs and I could now barely breathe. It hurt so bad. As soon as the alien no longer needed touching, all the agents came back. They just ma mysteriously materialized out of the brush. So we drove out to the highway to hand our patient off to the ambulance, and as soon as he was out of our hands, I drove straight to my chiropractor's office. When I walked in, Dr. Fry looked at me and said, Oh, crap! Well, that's not quite what she said, but she was startled by my condition. My navel was four inches left of the midline. I told her, you're not supposed to say that to the patient, but, well, <laughs> the, the cat was already out of the bag. I spent the next three months going to see the doctor every day as she manipulated and maneuvered my spine back into alignment. This was the same week as Hurricane Katrina that sank New Orleans. I spent the whole time watching TV from the couch as my unit was over there trying to help out. It is fun and it's exciting being a medic, but it's not the kind of thing just anyone can or should do. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. If you enjoyed the show and you'd like to hear other episodes, you can find all of my archives on iHeartRadio in the podcast section. Or you can watch them on YouTube. The older shows do not have a video. It's just a, a, a 
picture with me speaking. Uh, that was before I thought anybody actually wanted to see me. I tell people I have a face for radio and a voice for print. I got that from Ian Punnett. He used to be on Coast to Coast. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy one of my books at Amazon.com. You can pick up either Paranormal Laredo, the Laredo Paranormal Research Society, Fort McIntosh and the Paranormal, and more Paranormal Stories. No, it's Paranormal Stories. If you have a good or even a bad UFO story that you'd like to share with me and the public, you can contact me at strangethings at arcanasa.com. Send me your story and I'll poke it over a bit, you know, make the words look good. And I'll send you back a draft so you can say, yes, that's what I thought I saw or no, that's not how it went. We'll manipulate the story, make it sound good. Uh, language wise a lot of people when they write these stories it's like one paragraph with like five thousand words in it or they'll start out telling the end of the story and then they'll get to the beginning of the story and the end of the paragraph so what i'll do is i'll take the words and i'll realign realign them so that it's readable now i'm not going to change what you say i'm just going to make it read better it's like, have you ever watched a movie without the background music? It sucks. So what I do is I try to add just a little background music so that the story makes a little more sense. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, heck, tell people you don't even like. They should be listening to Strange Things with Chris James. Till next Saturday, see you then. Are you, are you, coming to the tree, where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three? Strange things have happened there, no stranger would it be, if we met, at midnight, in the hanging tree.